very, very, very happy and pleased to have with us uh, Mira, Mira Nair. Um, of course, needs no introduction, especially in Kerala. Uh, but important to say that Mira uh, and I are of the same generation. Uh, she probably doesn't know that we were in Delhi studying around the same time and I knew all your mad friends, Mira. Uh, <laughs> you were at Miranda, weren't you? Correct. That's yes. right. And all the Annies and all the. So all the I was at girl. LSR. Yeah, I Achha. was at around that time. We were the good time. girl, and we were the wild girls. That's right. No, no. We were. Yeah, who were supposed to be the good girls? We were wild enough. <laughs> so, uh, I think uh, most important and uh, most crucially, Mira uh, showed us um, how to be mad and. Uh, crazy and break through and get there really. Uh, at a time when um, all of us were sort of thinking of film, Yevo, and uh, finally did get into film, but our role models were all, um, you know, so, um, you know, these, these great men, it was always about the men, et cetera. And I remember always thinking of you as somebody who was sort of just there with us and then you just flew. Uh, it, it was absolutely wonderful and I really must say that has always been a very special thing for me and I've always felt this connect and thought that one day Mira will come to the Kerala Film Festival <laughs> and yeah but you will soon uh, so of course your career needs no rewind on it uh, from starting from Salam Bombay to uh, the latest which we've all just been watching on uh, on the television on uh, Netflix, uh, Suitable Boy. It's been quite a journey. Uh, mm -hmm. But before we sort of get into Mira, uh, this is the occasion at the film festival where we remember uh, Mr. Arvindan, uh, G. Arvindan, a well-known filmmaker. Uh, while Mira was the inspiration, uh, Arvindan was my guru. He was uh, certainly a person who, he was like this big tree and we all just grew in the shade of that tree and uh, uh, it was extremely shocking when we lost him. Uh, so prematurely, uh, he did fantastic work. Of course, he made 10 films in that time and also left a legacy of uh, students of people who you know there's so many people who he has sort of nurtured which was really beautiful which was also that article I sent you from Sadhanand who was also one of the people who really uh, was nurtured yeah. by uh, Arvindan. Uh, it's odd that we have this lecture uh, named after him uh, because he was a person of very few words. <laughs> He would yes. not say very much. And at the festival, unfortunately, it's the lecture that's named after him. Or, But it's important because, uh, you know, as time goes, and I don't know if you realize that youngsters are rather uh, unthoughtful of uh, this history. kind of past and history. Yeah. Not uh, not in a critical way, I would say it, but just I think it is the condition of youth, let's say, <laughs> that you don't really uh, acknowledge or um, often uh, remember this. So it's important that we have this event every year. We have a big filmmaker come share their thoughts. So it's not really a lecture. It's a moment of thinking, reflection. Uh, we are not... Uh, only thinking of work, but we're also thinking of larger issues of life. What is our role as the artist? What is our relationship with society? Uh, you know, it's a, it's a much broader conversation that we do look at. Uh, mm -hmm. So I'm really happy and proud to welcome you to this session. And uh, would you like, did you meet Arvindan? Would you like yes, to? I would yeah? love to. Yeah, yeah, just say a few yeah, words yeah, and yeah. then we'll. So, Thank you so much for inviting me to give this or have this conversation with you in honor of the great, great, great G. Aravindan, whom I did and had met in a tongue-tied 
<laughs> adoring state. Uh, I think it was 1978 uh, in Delhi uh, at the okay. panorama okay. of uh, of the Indian Film Festival, yes, in yes, which yes. I think and in which he was showing Thampu, uh, it, uh, and uh, and I did see it. I've seen two of his films, uh, Thampu and uh, uh, Oridat, but that was the first one, and it was the most, you know, charming and tender and. And in, in a sense, very extraordinary film because it used real people uh, like I was going to do in my later work without having any idea that I would. Uh, and it was the first time that, yeah. I, that I saw that, you know, in the circus life yeah. of and and uh, and then I met and, and I loved the tenderness and the and the sort of humor and humanity, of course, of it. But it, there was no pretension and no, it was like the man himself mm. whom then I met, but just as a fan, just as a movie lover. I, I remember being completely tongue-tied because he had this feeling of Quality, being like, yeah. a, you know, he, like was, a, yeah. he was like a guru, yeah. although he didn't take, not to take himself so seriously. Yeah, exactly. It was this formidable yeah, piece presence, of, yeah. Of presence you know um and it's wonderful that you have this lecture named after him because i always believe that we must say the names we must say the names Absolutely. and we must remember the names of those who have, have have deeply become a part of our fabric but we forget you know mm. and it's so true that we must remember Aravindan because he he had such an interesting uh, you know background too from being working in the rubber in the, you know rubber, rubber official board, yeah he was in the rubber and board he went into uh, he was the, a cartoonist the cartoon. yeah yeah i mean and he was a political cartoonist Absolutely. and and i think that 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 uh, a combination of of uh, humor but really an astute way of looking at the politics Absolutely. of our world and especially of india was is actually uh, of his cartooning as well as really of his films uh, except that we did not know about his extraordinary visual flair, which mm -hmm. we saw in the uh, in the two films that I've seen, uh, because he was an avant-garde visually. Mm -hmm. You know, he he just he just did what he wanted to do with the camera, and it was a very liberating and a new way of seeing. Um, in addition to using real people often mm -hmm. with actors, and I wondered yesterday when I was reading and and looking at his work whether it might have been a seed for me. Uh, in making Salam Bombay, uh, where which also began with a circus and also used real circus people, uh, but and real uh, children, uh, street real street children. Uh, I don't know, but it must have been you know Aravindan must have given me the seed in some ways, and I am so grateful to be asked to honor him today and to remember him as much as we all really should in as students of cinema. Wonderful. Yes, we all we really miss him, actually. And this very, very hectic uh, world of of cinema, actually, that kind of quiet uh, presence is really missed, I must say. Mm -hmm. uh, interesting that you spoke of, uh, you know, Salam Bombay and Varadat. Uh, Salam Bombay, uh, I remember watching it for the first time all those years ago and, you know, this Dickinson world of these children and um, so, uh, so let's first, uh, let me ask you, how did you get to Salam Bombay? Why, what uh, sort of drove you there? You and Suni uh, worked together. I know Suni also very well. So, you know, it was, uh, it's just, uh, how did you get there? And then I just want to know, um, how did you take off from there? Why did you choose or were you not given the choice of, uh, you know, a, a career path that took you away uh, physically uh, from uh, the stories that seem to have been so much a part of your life and so much a part of your, you know, your grain really. So if you could just talk about that and it sure. would be nice to, yeah. Sure. Um, you know, my journey began not to be a filmmaker. I grew up in Orissa, I grew up in Bhubaneswar. There was not even a cinema hall uh, until I was 10 years old. And, and when the cinema hall was born, Ravi Talkies, I remember, it was only, you know, 
marginal sort of Bollywood films or Dr. Zhivago that played every Sunday. And it was certainly not even a form that I considered serious or, you know, something that pulled me. Uh, my my um, influence and my juices really came from books, from reading and from uh, observing and working in, in life with people. Uh, I thought maybe I was a writer. I used to write, I used to, but the, the, the real trick, the, the, the switch came in the form of Jatra, this fantastic mythological mm -hmm. traditional theater that would come through our, uh, through Bhubaneshwar, through, you know, and, and, and just speak great stories of good and evil using very little props, uh, using, probably transporting you in hashish in some way mm -hmm. the, the, or, and and they would transport me and and it was this jatra that led me to pursue theater mm -hmm. and i became mm -hmm. an actor a very amateur actor i was in an all girls convent in tara hall in simla i used to always play the guy i was always <laughs> daddy long legs or captain <laughs> of hms pinafore i used i i loved uh, jeffrey kendall and shakespeare wala the, yeah. that whole Iriana that would come through and it was in that context that I'd met Barry John who was this wonderful English director who had made India his oh, home and who hasn't Barry touched in that generation he completely amazing changed my life you know, all of us <laughs> Yeah, he had this company, Theatre Action Group. And when I went to Miranda House as an undergraduate, um, I became a part of Theatre Action Group. And I always still tease Barry that he always cast me as the boyfriend's mother and never the, you know, the girlfriend. Lilette, 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 was the always the girlfriend. Mm. And uh, so I pursued theatre very seriously as an actor and I felt happy on stage performing we then i then worked with badalda badal sharkar in in calcutta and we we set up political street plays that he would you know make happen and we would go out into the streets and perform these things but throughout this two three year period of being completely immersed in the theater i i i looked for the question of can theater change the world can we impact anything at all um, are actors only going to be in their own narcissistic sphere or can we actually reach out and make a difference in the world? These were my idealistic and genuine questions. And also I felt for some reason, kind of in a secret way, I applied for scholarships to go abroad because I thought that I was perhaps an academic, I perhaps could you know, do that. And luckily or strangely got a scholarship to go to Harvard and uh, went there for the first time leaving my country at age 19. Yeah. And there the theater was totally apolitical and did not speak to me. And I had to uh, find a way to be a scholarship student, what would I study? And I lucked upon um, a Cinema Verite teaching a course with Ricky Leacock, the great oh, Richard wow. Leacock, okay. who actually pretty much was, told to, was inventing the mobile yeah, camera, camera yeah. and, mm -hmm. and, and, and Penny Baker. Uh, and, the, and I studied with them and that changed everything because I found a way to engage with the world, you know, visually. Uh, and I found a way to make the life, you know, in front of me and all its struggles and its injustices or whatever I used to get upset about. I, I found a way of converting that into film, you know. Mm -hmm. So for many years, for seven years, I, I studied Cinema Vahite, which was basically um, making unmanipulated documentaries about real people as they lived their lives. Uh, and in, in the course of making one of them, I made a film called India Cabaret. Yeah, of uh, course. Yeah, yeah which mm -hmm. is 1984. And um, that gave, and I lived with the, these, it was about two dancing girls, Rekha and Rosie, who performed in a cabaret yeah. in, in Ghatkopar. And, and, uh, and, and I used to literally live with them. And in the mornings after they would wake up from dancing until 3 a.m., a little chaipa, a little tea boy would yeah, always chaipa. be in their flat mm -hmm. with-, with so you know, he turned up in monsoon tea. wedding, yes. Yeah. yeah. And, and uh, anyway, that little tea boy and his flamboyance at performing dancing for these cabaret dancers while serving them tea, uh, was one of the early thoughts. There were several others. Just looking at the incredible lack of 
pity uh, in their lives of a childhood which was not a childhood, a childhood in which they had really nothing except the spirit to live. And that's what inspired me initially about making Salam Bombay. And I yeah. reached out to Suni Tarapurwala, who was my best friend, really. We were both in college together at Harvard. And, and she's the Bombay Wala. You know, yeah. I'm from Delhi. Yeah, and yeah. I was living in Antop Hill with the dancers and I had spent different times in Bombay, but uh, Suni is the Bombay person. And she lived near Grant Road. And, and I talked to her about uh, making Salam Bombay, uh, but making it not as a documentary because by that time I was tiring of documentary not having audiences basically mm, you know mm. uh, and and they, it was yeah. the 80s and there was yeah. no form like there is now yeah, yeah. and so and I also wanted more control over the narrative about how to tell it how to light it how to mm. uh, what to do and anyway we it was Salam Bombay was a real amalgam therefore about working in the theater working in the documentary fashion but mm. working in fiction for the first time um, I asked Barry John to come and hold a workshop of street mm. kids. Uh, we had a uh, 129 kids, of which we whittled down to 24 kids, oh, okay. and all these kids are in the film Salam Bombay. And then asked Nana Partekar, who was his first film, I think, is Salam Bombay. Anita Kamar, who I loved her work from Buniyad, uh, the television yeah, series. Yeah, the series. Yeah. And, and Raghubir Yadav, who would who, uh, you know play Chilam, and in fact discovered uh, Irfan Khan, Irfan. I went to the mm. National School of Drama uh, and and really was riveted by this 18 year old gangly boy, mm. Irfan, and I asked him to leave school for six months and come live with me. And oh, he was be, only 18. Okay. He was only 18 and he was, and he, and, and he was going to be Salim uh, until we real who was one of the street kids, but uh, until the real kids whom we worked with were all so malnourished that they only reached Irfan's waste, you know, mm. he was towering above mm. them and, 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 and it didn't work as a unit. So, Poor guy, it was the most difficult thing I've done. I had to uncast Irfan and give him the only scene as a non-kid that he could play in Salam Bombay. That right le letter. Hmm. Yes. The, the, That's the, such the a scribe. sad scene, my God. Such an incredible scene that Suni wrote. In one scene, you get the whole picture, you know, Absolutely. beginning, middle Absolutely. and end. It's an amazing scene in which Irfan played so brilliantly. But... Anyway, so Salam Bombay came out of that marriage of knowing mm -hmm. Cinema Vahite and, and knowing the theater and, and knowing how to, and working in life, you know, working on the streets. Um, um, and that's how it was born. And it was really a film made uh, with not much support at all. You know, I would shoot in the morning and then raise money all night for the next morning. It mm. was kind of like that. And, um, but it was, uh, it was a great fairy tale as to what happened after the film, because we were, we were asked to come to the competition at Cannes. We were, we won the it's camera, camera door. Door. Yeah. we won, we won uh, you know, we went right up to the Oscars. We, yeah. we had a, and it was the first Indian film to, um, actually be commercially released in every country in the world oh, uh, really? at that time. And, mm. and I remember, you know, really being exhausted by nine months of publicity that I had to do. Um, but after Salam Bombay, you know, it was not a question of leaving my country. I, 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 never, I, I never felt that way. And, and I'm, you know, I have an Indian passport that is like an accordion full of visas mm. because I can't bring myself to think of myself as anything other than from India. But um, the fact was that I also knew what it felt like to live between worlds, you know, to live um, not, not, you know, I felt, I used to say my roots are strong. That's why I can fly. It was never to leave it, but always to interpret that condition of being between places. And that's what led me to make Mississippi Masala, my second film, uh, which was about being brown between black and white, you know, which mm -hmm. is my experience really in, um, at, at college and at, in America. And, mm -hmm. and uh, again, brought it to SUNY who had another way of looking at it, which was beautiful, which was uh, also informed by a friend she had who 
an Indian friend who was with a um, Jamaican man and, 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 and the, the trials of that and the beauties of that as well. So we put our heads together. And again, like most things, we, we made this out of really understanding that motels in the south of India, in the south of America, America. In the south were all <laughs> run by, you know, Ugandan exiles who had come, who had left Idia means Uganda from which they were expelled in 1972. Mm. So we may, you know, we used to do research for almost a year before the screenplay was written and before mm -hmm. that, um, you know, before that world was created. And I'm very happy to tell you, Bina, that uh, it's the 30th anniversary of Mississippi Masala. This oh, really? Year. Oh, really? Yes, and we are re-releasing the oh, film. Oh, fantastic. Patrick. How nice. And, uh, and I also think of it as an anthem to Kamala Harris, you know? Yeah. Now the vice president of this country. Absolutely. And who could well be the child of Denzel exactly. and Denzel Denzel. Chaudhry. Absolutely, yes. And exactly that, yeah. Exactly that. And a new energy now to look at this film that still remains fairly radical and quite updated. Hmm. Because at the time it was released 30 years ago, it did very well, but it was uh, still, uh, you know, it, it was not so simple to be... Uh, yeah, so a director, you know. So the, I actually, I was going. That was going to lead to my next question. That what was it like uh, at that time? You were this young girl. You came from a background, uh, and how how did you find your way around all this? I mean, you know, it's it, it's such a such a complex. Uh, yeah. time as well you know it's the 80s it's mm -hmm. um, you know India is going through its boom finding its own new avatar uh, so if you could talk a bit about that and how did you how did you remain anchored how did you find the resource in yourself not to get uh, you know not to get lost in a sense but get more mm -hmm. and more focused mm -hmm. well and a bit about that time. What was it like? What was the film industry like? What were you looked upon like? You know. Well, you know, it, it helped that when I left India to come to study in America, I was part of an institution hmm. that was considered hmm. sort of the elite, hmm. uh, like hmm. the Harvard. And, and it's interesting. They, I always call it the foolish confidence of the Ivy League, you know, because hmm. they give you a feeling when you're in such places that mm. you can do anything and that nothing is impossible. Uh, and, and you, on the other hand, can look at this gang around me, like what's a, a Caroline Kennedy was my mm. neighbor and so and so, <laughs> you know, Sanam Bhutto uh, and I had lunch, you know, many times yeah. together in the dining hall. There were all sorts of people there that, mm. that kind of came from the ruling class of the world. Absolutely. And, and it gives you an, it, it takes away the illusion you know, of, of the elite, you feel like, oh, people are human beings on the one hand. And on the other hand, um, it gave me that foolish confidence that, oh, you know, I can stick to my guns, I can be who I am. I'm not, I never thought of myself as an immigrant, like somebody who used this thing to come to America. I never was, I was a Desi through and through, and I was going to never let anyone forget it. That's just who I am. Yeah, like I, I'm mm, sort of fiercely yeah. independent type of creature. Mm. Um, so even from the beginning, Bina, I never wanted to explain my culture or to pander to your to hears ignorance of our culture. Although that time in the late 70s and 80s, they could barely spell India. You know, there was mm. no knowledge of mm. our Indian reality at all in in, in the Western world, you know, even when we were nominated for the Oscars for Salam Bombay, which was 1988, I remember whispering to uh, Suni, who was sitting next to me in the ceremony. Uh, it was Jacqueline Bisset and uh, who was the other one, um, you know, who made the announcement uh, mm. of best foreign film. And they could literally not say the name India. I mean, they could, they literally, their tongues were twisted around just even where we came from. Yeah. Forget about our names. Um, it was that, it was that far away, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but somehow I always was drawn to the stories that were at home uh, or even to questions about why are we the way we are? That mm -hmm. is why that led me to make the do earlier documentaries, India Cabaret and so on. Um, 
so so i came from that type of slightly bullheadedness that okay. i'm not going to be grateful uh, i'm going to in fact educate you about where i about where i come mm, from rather yeah. than the other way around of being grateful to become part of you so i never had a plan but i never wanted that plan of going to hollywood you know and being on an a list with some mm. you know because those days though it's it was if you were a woman i mean you would be if you would be considered lucky to get a romantic comedy to re- direct or something you know and a, mm-hmm. uh, something mm-hmm. that had nothing to do with my reality so mm-hmm. i came out of really fiercely independent cinema mm-hmm. and i came out of making my distinctiveness my calling card you know mm-hmm. as opposed to uh, becoming Kind part of, mm-hmm. you know and uh, that is what led me to make mississippi masala and that is what led me to turn down a lot of films after salam bombay they offered me every uh, film about a child uh, of mm. any at all. you know i got sarafina from south africa okay. this one that one i could have been making the same film forever you know mm. but somehow uh, didn't do that and created my own path which was a lonely path i have to tell mm. you it wasn't mm. something it wasn't something you know people are not waiting for me to yeah. open uh you know to have i mean why did denzel washington say yes to uh mississippi masala he had already won his oscar for glory but he said yes for two reasons one because he loved salam bombay and he felt that he could be he could trust me as the director because i got performances from non actors actors you couldn't even tell who was an actor who was not mm. because it was one world but two he had never been asked to play opposite an indian woman or he had never been asked to play the black asian you know uh, the, the, the that meeting point and that was um, you know that was a lot of people felt that in the world at that time i remember the when i went to do publicity to open mississippi masala in england in 1992 uh, the lines around the block were hybrid couples were interracial couples mm-hmm. who had never seen their interraciality on a screen and uh, it made me slowly slowly get over the loneliness of it and know very late very late as in life uh, that i ha- maybe was had an audience you know for my kind mm-hmm. of work um and and that's how i went along really always making trying to make things that really mattered to me rather than being considered um you know for the biggest and best projects kind of thing i always did my own projects in a way. but uh, also just to ask that when you say you came from a jatra tradition you come from of course the the modern indian cinema and the how how did that change for you uh, how did you uh, you know uh, uh, how did so, our cinema change how no did how did change? how did you change your way or uh, did you how did you find this way because i'm interested because i i, I mean you know it's like can somebody here like a raj kapoor make a film in uh, the us and be successful I, i mean you know the, there is a there is a cultural difference uh, mm-hmm. and uh, yeah and uh, did you have to consciously uh, you know or, or would you you see my my, uh, my cinematic education started late in life uh, when i was 20 years old that was mm. when i'm ashamed to say this but when i was 20 in cambridge massachusetts was when i first saw the apu trilogy for instance mm-hmm. in well, that time in yeah. india in the 70s possible, yeah. we could not see our serious cinema you know uh, that's why i remember so clearly watching arivind uh, Ar- arivindan uh, tampu mm-hmm. was because uh, i could see it at the panorama in in the indian film festival there were no really easy ways to see anything regional mm. or anything mm. classical apart from the raj kapoor the 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 the, the commercial yeah. cinema, you know um and and for me my education began actually in the west about cinema, cinema and it was a spotty education but it was a powerful one in the sense that i was introduced for the first time to say the films of louis bunuel uh, of of um, you know jean rima of 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 uh, especially you know the great japanese directors i saw them here you know i saw i i began to get more influenced by that you mm. know that 
that the more the European and the Japanese cinema, honestly, than Indian cinema. Mm. And I in, and and I came also very, very squarely from the being a student of life, being a student of documentary cinema, this mm -hmm. cinema very day, where you where you surrender to life and what it is showing you. And that kind of electricity of not knowing what's going to happen to a documentary camera, like with the strippers in India Cabaret, I did not know. Uh, you know, when I went with one of them, Rosie, she, she, she used to dance and she used to collect money. And then she went across India and we followed her uh, in a train to Hyderabad to give her money to her sister for dowry for the sister's wedding. Instead of being at the wedding, she was, the money was taken from Rosie and she was shunned yes, and asked to not be polluted, not pollute the wedding. And this is life. This yeah. is our lives. These are the, life is infinitely more powerful and stranger than fiction. And my main influence came from that life, that life. you know, and that life to try to capture the electricity and unpredictability of everyday life with in narrative cinema became sort of in hindsight, I didn't set out to do Seven, this, yeah. but in hindsight became a kind of signature of my own films. You know, so pra practically in every film from Salam to Mississippi to Namesake to Monsoon Wedding, it's a, always a whole bunch of non-actors mixed with legendary mm -hmm. actors, you know, mixed with experienced actors. I've, I've always done that because I just feel like the spirit of what I'm looking for is in those people rather than in the A list or the B list, you know? Um, anyway, it's just one of those things. So I would say that my cinema or my way of working came from two things. One is that embrace of documentary in fiction, but the other is also, um, you, know, you know, basically following my own crazy instinct rather than, a, you know, a commercial path mm, that would lead mm. me here, you know. Um, and yeah, and, and, and then, you know, when, when, um, and because we were all raised so much in India on Russian fiction, on English literature, on Keats, on Shakespeare, <laughs> on, you know, we were given this, yeah, this, this, this absolutely literature. Mm -hmm. That's uh, that also gave me that grounding. So when I monsoon at wedding, I remember was a big hit. Uh, the studio who distributed it asked me to make the big, big fifty million dollar uh, Vanity Fair, hey. and I knew Vanity Fair, the book from oh. Thackeray, so deeply as a sixteen year old in India that I said, yes, I mean, I'd want to do this, you know, because I can say something about the empire, about the colonies, about, so, you know, social mobility at that time. I had a point of view about mm. it. And that's what's important really to preserve is mm. one's point of view as you make your, your work. But, but it is, it is, there is a loneliness because, you know, it's terrible to always be initially the novelty, you know, mm, uh, of, of, exactly. uh, you know, mm. uh, and I, um, I, uh, I, it's only after some years of seeing that I began to small, small have an audience for this kind of hybrid mm. view, way, way of seeing the world and living that I realized that I could use that confusion or I could use that seesaw of living between spaces in my work and not feel that this was an anomaly. Exactly. And, and as the world has become so crazy and global and interconnected, that I'm not alone in that. You know, mm. there are several of us who live between worlds. Mm. But, but still I would say that the way I get in, the way I get inspired by both the injustice and the crazy poet poetry of, of India, there's nothing else. And India and Pakistan, India and now it's Pakistan, yeah. alas, but the subcontinent is a, is, is a major fuel for what excites me, you know, in my work. Which gets me to my other slightly controversial question uh, about how, um, how the diaspora looks at the motherland kind of. Uh -huh. uh, you know how nostalgia creeps in, how there is this longing. And uh, the reality is it's fairly ugly, especially it's now. Dire. It's, it's very ugly now. Dire. So it's dire. Um, uh, how, how do you, uh, how are you able to um, sort of, you know, uh, 
put that into your work? How do you, I mean, how can you be a critic as well? Because I think what is required is also to look at this uh, country now with a different, uh, uh, and you know, uh, what I'm saying is, is there a conflict? Because there's this love, there's this craving, there's this wanting as a, which is a lot to do with the immigrant experience. Um, and on the other hand, the fact that you know what's happening here, you know what, uh, how this world is changing, uh, how we had imagined India is no longer what it's like. Uh, if you could talk a bit about that and how, how do you cope with this? How do you uh, deal with it? Do you address it? Uh, do you feel more comfortable not addressing it? Uh, just... Sure. Um... I mean, the state in our country now is is not distant from me at all. It's it's uh, it's uh, almost inconceivable, but it is true. You know, in terms of what India was created with and what it has become. You know, and and the sometimes the dire quality is because I don't know when the change can come. You know, I don't know what. The opposition is to counter such a colossal change that must come and return us to what what the seeds were of this nation and it was that that i had very much in mind when i was making suitable, suitable Board, Board. which is you know which was my last uh, film uh, series, series. Um, and and because vikram said the great author of of the novel which i have loved since it was written uh, wrote about this extraordinary idealistic nehruvian socialism yeah. this time that i have always loved that time when india and i mean it was a time of trauma too and partition and bloodshed uh, and terrible terrible schisms of 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 countries being formed when there were none when we were one um but there was also an idealism of forming who we are, how to break off the shackles of the British, how to break off the shackles of this colonial possession, and who are we, and who, what was the country that we will make? Um, and it was that question, and also the great fiction uh, that Vikram wrote about mm. these wonderful families Women. and characters who are deeply anglicized in their soul, and yet uh, from the fabric of this ancient <laughs> culture that we call ours, you know? so. It wasn't uh, that I made a suitable boy to uh, to reflect on today's world only. They were making the film, and I said I have to direct. This. You know, I would love mm -hmm. to direct it so that at least we can preserve some some sense of truth in it. Um, but when I was making it, the the parallels even that Vikram so presciently had integrated Babri Masjid was a mm -hmm great part of suitable boy you yeah, know yeah, used yeah. used in his narrative um and it was startlingly like today i mean the art was imitating life the day we were going to shoot in suitable boy kakori this the, these you know when the temple is being erected in front of the masjid Nothing, was nothing. the day the ayodhya verdict was going to take place so we had to shut down in in you know expecting violence and Fortunately, at that moment, none came, but it came later. But but it was that close, you know, and mm. I very much uh, never forgot that, you know, and used in the narrative of a suitable boy, that idea that we have to hold a mirror. I've always believed this, that we have to, our films have to hold a mirror to what is in the world today, you know, what is our society today. And in our, for me, that loss of syncretism, that loss of the fact that our culture is deeply intertwined uh, with what they now consider Islamic or you know uh, the Hindu and the Islamic. I mean, we've always been literally inextricable in in virtually every uh, every facet, whether it be music or language or uh, or poetry or friendships. It's always mm -hmm. been syncretic, and this is being so actively. And, and systematically dismantled. So for me, a suitable boy was not just a, about a mirror in the society, but also for the young of today in our country to remember that we came from that past, we came mm -hmm. from that cloth, which was interwoven. And I think that's so being challenged amongst so many other things that are being challenged. Mm -hmm. So it's not, it's not only about, you know, I, I'm just, I just gravitate towards 
towards subjects, I think, that, that uh, enable me to hopefully not be didactic about it, but to take it on and to, and to you know, steal you into a world that maybe makes you think anew about where you're at now. Not mm -hmm. everything is about, about, you know, that protest. There's another other ways as well. Right now I'm immersed in making my new film, which is on Amrita Sher. Amrita Sher. Amrita Sher. Yes, and it's called Amri, which is her, her nickname. Uh, and, and she, you know, died tragically at the age of 28 in 1941 before india even became independent but but she was uh, you know in her she was a real radical she was an iconoclast of course she was a great great artist uh, but she was penniless and at that time she was not recognized in her in her lifetime um, and it's not a political film in that sense at all, but it does become political. This is the other thing I love about mm -hmm. Aravinda because he was like that. He didn't make political films, but he made Everything films politically, yeah, yeah. you know? And that is what I like to do. And I believe that all films are, you know, that it's about your point of view and it's about what you choose to say about a person. Uh, so even in making this film on Amri, I feel like it's, she's like a, you know, uh, her iconoclasm and her, you know, belief in cutting her own path, but distilling India in a way that it had never been seen before in her paintings. Uh, and has, for me, she taught me how to see. She really taught me how to see, you know, in my work. Mm -hmm. You know, I've always looked to her paintings as a way of how to frame, how to make use color, you know, and so on. Uh, and I, so it's not that, uh, again, it's political in that way, but it's political in the way that it will remind us of uh, the greats uh, that, that have made us in a way who we are and whom we so easily forget, you know. Um, so that's how I work, Bina, more from, um, more from instinct, you know, more from what keeps me going and what fuels yes. me because it's really <clears throat> tough to make independence. But are you and angry? Are you, are you, is there anger in you? There is, I have to say, you know, sometimes uh, it becomes despair and that's not good because you just don't know where and how this is going to end and how will it change, you know? Um, um, and I try to fight against that despair and, and stay with the anger, <laughs> but, uh, but it's not easy. It's really not easy. Uh, and, um, but I must say, you know, people like the civic consciousness about it, you know, it mm -hmm. is what spurs me, you know, and keeps me going. And, and, and it's really sort of sad about COVID because actually, I'm trapped here in New York City mm. at the moment. I just can't go anywhere without getting vaccinated and, mm. and all of that. But I live more than half the year. The last two years, I've been yeah. fully in, in Delhi and in India. And I have my home in Delhi as much as I have in New York and as much as I have in Uganda. Uganda. But, but I can't connect them uh, with COVID. COVID. But, um, but I must say it's the, it's the people's uprising. It's the fact that when even when the CAA pro uh, the amendment, when the protests happened, I was in India. And it was so extraordinary just to see that finally the Hindu Muslim conflict was a civic conflict. You know, it was not, it was not about Hindus and not about Muslims. It was about everybody saying, we will not do this. We will not accept this, you know? Mm -hmm. It's that that gives me hope and that that gives me uh, just that energy to go on like the farmers are right now. Uh, but I do feel cut off and I cannot wait to come back. Uh, and I'm waiting. It's just a question of a month, but I'm waiting. <laughs> Uh, but that's what's hard, you know, it's that disconnect. Um, but um, fortunately, anything but despair, but despair is like a neighbor. Mm. But do you feel uh, the same connect with the US? Do you feel elated? Do you feel with the change that has happened with Kamala Harris coming on? Uh, yeah, well, do you see hope? Uh, there because uh, and you know with the black lives matter uh, as an indian how how you know there there is a sea change that we all hope yes. and again expect so yes, yes. do you feel that connect do you uh, uh, 
I you know I feel like in this country the last two years have been cataclysmic in terms of again civic movements rising up and saying no more from me to to black lives matter uh, and now you can see almost a reverse like defense mechanism of everything is really saluting a person mm -hmm. of color we are once again a uh, flavor of the i hope not the moment the we, are, the we, are, we are the current favorites <laughs> <laughs> and i laugh about it because sometimes you know I, I i know very well what it is to feel like a, a marginal novelty and now everyone around me is being shamed into looking at people who look like me and work like me as somebody who means business or is serious you know so it's a little amusing but it's also real it's also real uh, it's it's very much in the fabric here so yes i feel uh, definitely especially with the black lives matter movement uh, i feel again not only because it's a black movement it's totally almost more a white movement it's mm. it's really a civic movement and it has and is changing uh, the way we look at media because that's what isn't it the most powerful yeah. thing how we are represented yeah, exactly. and now everyone's on the back foot wanting to be in the front foot again so in that sense i definitely feel energized you know by what's going on here although i'm a little i don't trust it fully sometimes because i yeah. know it's 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 all about you know a, it's a reaction rather than something intrinsic yeah. but but it's um also becoming intrinsic and but and and politically it's just a big big relief to have had this election and to know that we are not subjected to four more years of cruelty and craziness really mm -hmm. however we also know that more than 70 million people voted for him and and that is also almost half this country you know mm -hmm. so it's a very it's again that democles sword is very much above us here in terms of which way one could go you know um but a, a huge sense of relief generally with the election not just for america but for the for world, the world. Uh, and uh, and so i have to you know ride with that but i have to say just to be honest uh, that the connect uh, that that intrinsic connect is for me much more for the subcontinent than it is for this mm -hmm. continent yeah uh just a little bit about the me too movement uh just uh, did you do you think it has has it uh, made that difference has it uh, changed the way i mean uh, uh, that uh, women are able to work in the industry uh, how how has that sort of or was it just as you say a kind of flavor of the month kind of thing that happened and uh, or do you think there has been intrinsic change that did happen with that and uh, are you seeing that being a woman being somebody in the industry there uh, if you could just talk a little about that i think it was the me too movement was seriously uh, was a very serious thing that for the first time really shone the light on the desperate inequity and the gross uh gross. injustice uh of of the of of the industry how it was just people knew but it was taken for granted this abuse mm. this this domination of you know over women who wanted to make it in the business um i also know you know i used to be defensive about it myself like oh yeah i never think about being a woman i would yeah exactly you know, i would all that, that you know made us all and, think yeah you know but but the fact is that in even if if i look back on even success and and that i would say let's say salam got all these awards or so and so you know still the the exposure or the or the chances or the opportunities were not increasing for me at all i still had to be a scrappy fighter warrior to get the next thing made it was yeah. never never simple i was definitely on a different equation than a male director who would who would have had been who got the camera mm. door who went to oscars they would be making you know the biggest blockbuster in two years flat you know 
and I could see that, but I never succumbed to it because I was here to do my thing and I was gonna be fiercely independent about doing it. And only later I realized that I had actually an audience perhaps that wanted my work, right? So mm. I knew that, but I, but I just kept myself going. Now, it's, it's more the confluence of Me Too with Black Lives Matter mm. in this country and in this industry that has made a colossal sea change difference because people have signed those inclusivity things that you have to have you know 50 percent mm. being women 50 percent people of color all of that it's really making a difference so people are now especially during covid it's like a colossal development going on in the hollywood of the world you know uh, where uh, no longer you know sort of all white projects about a black figure we can't be tolerated. The hmm. They cannot be tolerated. Uh, no, so they seek people like us to front them or to, <laughs> to say, you know, come and be, come and add color to our lives. Even that <laughs> cannot be tolerated. <laughs> so, uh, it's very interesting what's going on, but it's the the fact is that there are the, the opportunities have just wide open exploded for for women for you know like you're you're they are shamed into opening the doors to us, you know, mm-hmm. in a very different way than it was before. Very different way. You know, it's almost like you, you know, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm being, I'm producing a number of things that are seeking, you know, female directors that are seeking, mm. uh, you know, powerful directors who happen to be women. That's, you know, so in that sense, I would say there is a big change, you know, um, but you have to be ser- you have to be astute about it you know it's not enough you know you have to look to see why are we being quoted you know what mm. are we being able to say you have to still be vigilant about mm. what we you know what you stand for and what we stand for so uh, but it is definitely a different world in terms of the encouragement and the doors opening you know um, to to women especially uh, and now to people of color Mm -hmm. which uh, leads me now to uganda (laughs) there's another world you have and uh, i mean of course the film queen of cartway which we've shown in kerala we've shown most of your films in kerala Uh, but just to talk about uh, what you're doing there in terms of training and uh, why did you choose uganda why uh, what is that uh, what is that about now Yes, yes. <laughs> well, um, you know, you, I had never been to the African continent, forget about Uganda, you know, uh, until 1989, when I, uh, pursuing the idea of Mississippi Masala, you know, researching for the script, because a number of people who owned American motels in the South came from oh, Uganda. from Uganda, exactly. right, yeah. So that led us to wanting to go to this land where they, which they all dreamed about, but I had never seen and Suni had never seen. So we, the two of us went to Uganda then and it was at the, just finishing with the civil war. It was bombed out, it was soldiers. It was uh, actually the most terrifying place and the most beautiful, but yeah. uh, terrifying place I'd ever been to because of the, because of the bloodshed. Um, and all of that made it into our Mississippi Masala movie. But, uh, you know, unexpectedly, and also Uganda, I must tell you, also reminded me deeply of my childhood home of oh, Orissa, okay. you know, and I felt weirdly at home there and uh, whatever it was, but I fell in love there and I met my husband there, Mahmoud Mamdani. And and uh, since 89, he was a professor at Makarere at the university and um, pretty much since 1989, uh, we have lived there and made it our home as much as our home is uh, here and in India also, but, um, and uh, I had my son there, Zoran, in 1991, and... Um, just a moment, he's just won an election, huh, Zoran? Yes, he has. <laughs> Wonderful, he's congratulations. He's 29 years old yeah. now, and he's, yeah. he's the assemblyman yeah. uh, of Astoria, Queens. He, he, yeah, he's a democratic yeah. socialist uh, yeah. in New York City. It's amazing. Yeah. And he, he was, well, I'm looking at a and, and he was he was this little in Uganda. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> but, uh, and I think I met him in Gujarat when he was a young man with your sister's uh, son. They were on holiday. Yeah. Oh, wow. 
yes, he yes, yes. and they were hanging on to oh yeah <laughs> yes yes he's 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 here now very much uh yeah. very rooted uh, in making change um yes okay, so, so sorry you were in uganda so, yeah so i was in uganda we made mississippi masala that was in 1991 and and uh, and lived there uh, ever since um, and and you know those days because i had like a little ankle or a foot in hollywood and a foot somewhere else uh, a lot of the few films that were set in africa would be offered to me you know mm. and always i would see that it was never about the african continent that i lived in you know it was never about the people who really made up this place mm -hmm. it was always through either a white observer or you know if it was steve biko's film it was always about donald woods and the mm -hmm. journalist if it was about it was another film i was offered called white mischief who, which was uh, always about you know colonial neurosis as a <laughs> unnamed maasai warrior stood in the horizon looking <laughs> elegant and angular uh, and i got really um, tired of that and 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 for my years, I had served as a mentor in Sundance and at Moonstone, different labs around the world. And I decided to set up my own lab in East Africa, primarily with the idea that if we don't tell our own stories, no one else will. And how do we create a local film culture, but a local film culture that was made by Africans, made by Ugandans, made by East Africans uh, at its highest level, not as an apologist, to mm. there we are, you know, and and I because of my my whatever my exposure, I knew several people. I knew great directors in India. I knew great writers in America. I knew several people, and and I would broach this idea with them, like come and mentor for two weeks with my students in East Africa, and we can create something. And pretty much everybody, you know would say yes. So it would be Vishal Bhardwaj from India. It would be Abdir Rahman Sisako from, from Mauritania. Mauritania. It would be, you know, Jason Fellardi from Hollywood. It would be, um, you know, Stephen Frears from England. They all said yes. And mm -hmm. we created this Maisha, which was uh, called, uh, Maisha is a Swahili word, which means zest for life. And that is the name of our film school. It's now been 16 years running. Okay. Uh, it's a free school. Uh, we create um, about six workshops a year, primarily to train in screenwriting. And then we have two workshops of production where we take the scripts that have come out uh, and the writers that have come out of our screenwriting workshops and they gather and we choose four scripts that we actually enter and make production on. Uh, okay. So the students leave with 15 to 20 minute films from Maisha. And we've done this both in fiction and in documentary now for 16 years. And we and the goal for me was to create simply five great original film directors from the continent, from the East African region. Today we have closer to 28, oh, you know. Really? On the region yeah and they're all working in in film in different capacities but they are there and now uh, we are transitioning Maisha is kind of winding down because it's a it's a free school it's very tough to mm. keep raising money for this and people are now making their work it's a, mm. there is a profession there is a film culture and and now we are transitioning into another stage of how can we you know, we are, we, are, we are evaluating ourselves and we are making a film uh, called the Maisha Legacy film of 16 years and what we've done and, 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 and the different uh, students and now, and most of our students have become mentors and have come back to teach at Maisha. So it was, it was about that. It was about creating film culture that told our own stories by our own people in the best way in our own languages. And, um, and that's what Maisha stood for. Uh, and stands for, and um, and and then anyway, this continued, and then I wanted. Then I was asked. Then I was introduced to this idea that became Queen of Katwe, which uh, I also wanted. You know, uh, Mississippi Masala was done like 1991, mm -hmm. and I had now lived in Uganda cl closer to 30 years, and wanted to tell another story of the day-to-day -day contemporary mm. life of what it's really like. And the great, great story of Fiona Mutesi, an utterly true story of a slum kid who becomes a grandmaster and, and, and in chess and takes her family out of the slum mm. is, is, 
is really inspiring and utterly true. And uh, it was a way, you know, I wanted to do that. But the beauty of making Queen of Katwe in the streets 15 minutes from my home uh, was that 30% of the crew was Maisha alumni. You know, oh, it was yeah. made with everyone who came out of the school. Yeah. And this is a Hollywood big union movie. It's not a, you know, in, you know, a small thing. And they were so professional that they're all there, you know. So it makes me, uh, you know, wow. it was hard. Yeah, it was really hard. Of course. Yeah. Lovely. Lovely to hear this. Really wonderful. <laughs> yeah, because I think that's... Uh... That's what life is about, giving back as well, really. Yeah, whatever yeah, no? you know. Yeah. <laughs> it's uh, just, useless. Uh, uh, since you've done so much work on, uh, it's a bit of a jump back. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I was just particularly interested in this that uh, you, you know, worked on adaptations and so on. Yes. I was very interested in the reluctant fundamentalist. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no but i the film you turned yes. into something else a uh -huh. bit of something else in terms of you know the the appearance of the character uh, so tell me about that process what is adaptation what is this process of adapting I, I, what about the suitable boy this 900 page uh, book 1, that we uh, 1300 page book that we've all plodded through uh, how do you find the essence and how much how much do you think you should sort of just i mean for me the re reluctant fundamentalist is a monologue right uh, of course he's talking to somebody but uh, um, you never see the person you know the whole uh, so if you could just talk about this process yeah. of uh, and why you did it like that why would you have chosen that form uh, well, you know um the reluctant fundamentalist um, was a very probably the hardest adaptation to mm. to make mm. because, as you said, it's like Camus. You know, it, it's a complete monologue. One man is talking to another that you don't see. Yeah. Um, uh, but uh, with leaving that aside, the world that that Mohsin Hamid creates in the reluctant fundamentalist. Um, is an extraordinary world, you know, of a brown man who loved exactly. America, who comes to America. And gets totally. Who's yeah. the lover of America, who goes right to the top of American Wall Street life with his blonde girlfriend and the whole thing. And how everything changes after 9-11 and he's now no longer anything else but a Muslim. Yes. And, uh, and not just that, but a Muslim who's working in high finance, you know, uh, being trained to basically rip off the workers of the universe to create mm. profit for big companies elsewhere. That's the other aspect of yeah. it. Yeah. Um, you know, we have our, you know, in this country, Jack Kerouac and On the Road mm. and all these coming of age stories. I had, I wanted to make that coming of age story of a brown man in an international world that was connected you know, and that was the reluctant fundamentalist. Um, mm. It was a very difficult adaptation precisely because it was written as a monologue, which is why I asked Mohsin Hamid, the author himself, who loves movies, to work with us. Oh, uh, to adapt. He, oh okay. Yeah, okay. initially uh, we spent three years uh, on who is Bobby, who is the person that Riz Ahmed's character is speaking to, uh, and and creating that character because it's really hard to make a film like a monologue. I mean, you mm. make it, then you reach like five people, you know, if mm. you don't, you know. Mm. So, and then we, you know, worked with Ami Boghani and William Wheeler, uh, the two screenwriters, uh, you know, to 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 populate that, to you know, uh, to to flesh that. But um, that was you know, that was the biggest invention in that film mm. is the character that mm. the main character is talking to, you know. But um, once we cornered that, the entire adaptation is very close to the yeah. book, except except uh, in the character of the girlfriend, uh, Erica, who mm -hmm. in the book is sort of a sliver of a human being who just yeah. disappears yeah. into thin air. And I find it very hard to... Uh, make female characters that are <laughs> that passive yeah. and that that way, you know. And also, we we converted her into an artist who um, 
now it's called cultural appropriation, <laughs> but who then takes on her yeah. lover Tinez's conflict and makes it her art. And, and I have been surrounded a lot by people like this. And so I wanted to kind of raise a glance at that, you know, as well. Um, but for me, a reluctant fundamentalist was really about having a dialogue with the Western world, which is what Chengiz does, you know, yeah. because too often, especially soon after 9-11, the dialogue was not a dialogue. It was a monologue from America, you know, saying yeah. axis of evil, this is the yeah. schism, yeah. Islamophobia, get them, you know, and, and you never heard where the bombs were dropped. You never heard on yeah. whom they were dropped. You never heard and saw the devastation or even the impact of this, uh, this, these attitudes in, in the rest of the world that we actually mm. came from. So the reluctant fundamentalist attempted to be that dialogue. Um, and, and I think it did, you know, and because, because I made it independently and I wanted to uh, and not make it with Hollywood, uh, it, it allowed me that freedom mm. to not censor itself before it was out, mm. you know. Mm. Of course, I knew that it wasn't going to be a blockbuster. I knew it was a political <coughs> film, mm. so Mm. everyone's not going to rush to the theater necessarily to see it but I really want to do work that I can stand by you know and that I can believe in and 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 for me that's very important whenever people get you know like I, I know I'm a team player and I work with people but when I'm left to do my own to, to have that control over my universe it inevitably somehow has an integrity that that, that I enjoy. And, and there are some, some films I have, like The Namesake or Monsoon Wedding or Salam or, um, you know, uh, even Queen of Cartway, that they, that I did what I wanted, you know? And, uh, and, and that was in The Reluctant Fundamentalist as well, because I had, had funding that, that, believe, that shared my politics and that mm. would not, you know, mess with them mm. and whitewash it in mm. essentially. So, yeah, it seems as if you were talking. I mean, I, I really get that feeling that there is the sense of you uh, very much over there as well. That's what I, I mean, that's what yeah. I'm really interested in. We keep trying. Well, yeah, it's been so wonderful speaking to you, Mira. Thank you so much. Thank you, um, Bina. Thank you for... Well, I mean, it's not just um, sort of hollow words that I'm trying to say, but I really... Um, think it's so important that we also get to know because I mean you see a body of work but you also need to know the you know the the, the beating heart the beating heart that's right <laughs> you got it and the this is really <laughs> the beating crazy hearts yeah that show us the way really so thank you you. We'll see Thank you, you for in for being with us. That's right. <laughs> Always he's there with us. <laughs> Thank you, Mira. See you soon. You, and Nina. do take care. Stay safe from the virus.